Welcome to Lecture 7.5, Euclidean Domains and Algebraic Integers. We first encountered Euclid and his book, The Elements, when we studied ruler and compass constructions. And now we'll revisit it for something else that it contains. Recall that he wrote this around 300 BC, and in it he described what is now known as the Euclidean algorithm. This appears in the seventh book of the Elements, where Euclid poses the problem as follows. Given two numbers not prime to one another to find their greatest common measure. And this is what we know today as greatest common divisor. The Euclidean algorithm works due to two key observations about the integers. First of all, if A divides B, then the GCD of A and B is equal to A. Second, if we write A as some multiple of B plus the remainder R, where R is less than A, then the GCD of A and B is the same as the GCD of B and R. This is best seen by an example. So let's take two large numbers. Let's say A equals 654 and B equals 360. We can write 654 as 360 times 1 plus 294. And the GCD of 654 and 360 is the same as the GCD of 360 and 294. So we've reduced the problem to a simpler one, and now we can write 360 as 294 plus 1 plus 66. And the GCD of 360 and 294 is the same as the GCD of 294 and 66. So we've reduced the problem again, and we can continue in this fashion. 294 is 66 times 4 with a remainder of 30, and the GCD of 294 and 66 is equal to the GCD of 66 and 30. 66 equals 30 times 2 with a remainder of 6 and the GCD of 66 and 30 is the same as the GCD of 30 and 6. Now what do you notice? 30 is a multiple of 6 and this was bound to happen. So now we write 30 as 6 times 5, and we appeal to this first property that the GCD of 30 and 6 is just equal to 6. We conclude that the GCD of the original two numbers, 654 and 360, is equal to 6. This is what Euclid came up with over 2,000 years ago. Let's return to modern day and see how this fits into the more general framework of rings. We will define something called a Euclidean domain, which loosely speaking is any ring for which the Euclidean algorithm still works. Here's a formal definition. An integral domain R is Euclidean if it has a degree function, which is a function D from the non-zero elements of the ring to the integers, satisfying the following properties. Non-negativity, which just means that the degree of every element is at least zero. Monotonicity, the degree of A is less than or equal to the degree of A times B for all elements. In other words, as you multiply by elements, you can never decrease the degree. And finally, the division with remainder property. This says for all elements in the ring A and B, where B is non-zero, there are elements Q and R, the quotient and remainder, such that A equals B times Q plus R. And this R, being the remainder, has to either be zero or its degree has to be less than that of B. Note that the second property could be restated to say the following. If A divides B, then the degree of A is less than or equal to the degree of B. Let's do some examples. 
The most basic one is the integers, which is Euclidean. And you could define the degree function to just be the absolute value. Next, any polynomial ring over a field in one variable is Euclidean. And you can take the degree function of a polynomial to just be the standard degree, so the highest power of x that appears in it. Finally, I want to introduce the Gaussian integers, which is quite literally the set of complex numbers of the form a plus bi, where a and b are integers. Sometimes this is written as r negative 1, which is what we will do later in this lecture when we study the algebraic integers. Other times it's written as z adjoined root negative 1, or just z adjoined i, because it can also be thought of as all polynomials in i. Notice that i squared is negative 1, so even if you take higher powers of i, you never get anything more than just a plus bi. So this is a Euclidean domain, and the degree function is the d of a plus bi is a squared plus b squared. So notice that this is actually the square of the standard complex norm. So if this is the complex plane, and we have complex number z, which is a plus bi, then the norm squared of z is z times z bar, which is a plus bi times a minus bi, which is a squared plus b squared. So the degree function is just the square of the complex number, z. And you may be wondering, why do we not just take the square root and define the degree function to be the standard complex norm. Well, technically we have defined the degree function to have codomain z, the integers. So the degree of every Gaussian integer has to be an integer, and so if we took the square root of that, we would break that property. Here's a basic property of Euclidean domains. It says the set of units of R are the non-zero elements with the same degree as 1. To prove this, we need to show two containments. First of all, that every unit has the same degree as 1. That's what we'll do first, right here. And conversely, that every element with the same degree as 1 is a unit. So the first thing to do is to show that associates have the same degree. And this is quite simple. Let's take two associates, A and B, in R. So by definition, A divides B, which means that the degree of A is less than or equal to the degree of B. Do you see where I'm going next? Well, B divides A. And so the degree of B is less than or equal to the degree of A. And together, this implies that A and B have the same degree. What we're trying to show is actually a special case of this. If U is a unit, then U is an associate with 1, and so u and 1 have the same degree. Conversely, let's take something on the right-hand side and show that it's a unit. So we'll take a non-zero element with the same degree as 1. Then, using the third property of Euclidean domains, we can write 1 as x times some q plus r, where either r is equal to 0, or the degree of r is less than the degree of x, which is equal to the degree of 1 by assumption. However, this is going to be a problem. I claim that the degree of r, or of anything, cannot be less than the degree of 1. Well, assuming r is non-zero, then the degree of 1 has to be less than the degree of r, because 1 divides r. And therefore, it would be impossible for the degree of r, or anything, to be less than the degree of 1. Therefore, r has to be 0, which means that qx equals 1, which means that x is a unit, because q is its multiplicative inverse. Here is a basic property. Every Euclidean domain is a PID. The proof is quite simple. Take any non-zero ideal and find the element b in there that has minimal degree. There might be more than one, just pick one of them. I claim that that b 
generates the entire ideal. So pick some other element in the ideal, call it A, and write A as some multiple of B plus a remainder R. So either R is zero, or the degree of R is less than the degree of B, which is impossible because R can be written as the difference of two elements in I, namely A and B, Q, and therefore R is in I, and B was chosen to have minimal degree. This means that R equals zero, which implies that A equals B times Q, and therefore A is in the ideal generated by B. So we took an arbitrary element A in the ideal I and proved that it was in the ideal generated by B, and therefore I is a principal ideal and hence R is a PID. Here are some exercises, just some easy things to check. First of all, the ideal generated by 3 and 2 plus root negative 5. Recall we've seen these numbers before in a previous lecture. This ideal is not principal in R negative 5. Recall that this was the set of numbers of the form A plus B root negative 5. We will s learn all about these later in this lecture, very shortly. And second, if R is an integral domain, then the ideal generated by X and Y is not principal in the polynomial ring over R in variables X and Y. So this ideal, let's see what this looks like. This is just the set of all elements of the form X times F of X plus Y times G of Y. So notice that this just means that there is no constant term. Because either of these polynomials could be zero, but together they ensure that every term has at least an x in it or a y in it. So as a corollary, we deduce right away that these rings, r negative 5 and r bracket x and y, are not Euclidean because they're not PIDs. We actually know a little bit more about R negative 5. That's not even a UFD. We saw this in the previous lecture, that we could factor 9 into irreducibles two different ways. 3 times 3, or 2 plus root negative 5 times 2 minus root negative 5. Now it's time to introduce the algebraic integers, which are the roots of monic polynomials over Z. Remember, monic just means that the leading coefficient is 1. This is a subring of the algebraic numbers, which is something that we saw when we studied field theory and Galois theory. Recall that these were the roots of all polynomials over Z. Henceforth, I will assume that M is a square-free integer not equal to 0 or 1. Recall when we studied field theory, the quadratic field, maybe I didn't call it that, but well, you can see where it gets its name, Q adjoined root M, which is the set of complex numbers of the form P plus Q root M, where P and Q are rational. Now, if M is positive, then this is a subfield of the real numbers. If M is 0 or 1, then this is just the rational numbers, and it's not actually a quadratic extension. So that's why we disallow those cases. Also, if m is not square free, then we can just pull out some square of the square root, and we can write the same field extension using a smaller m. So that's why we assume it's square free. Now we want to define a certain class of rings consisting of algebraic integers. So the ring rm will be the set of algebraic integers in q adjoin m. In other words, it is the subring consisting of those numbers that are roots of monic quadratic polynomials. In other words, x squared plus cx plus d with integer coefficients. So c and d are integers. Now, it's not clear a priori that this is actually a subring. In other words, that roots of monic polynomials should be closed under addition or closed under multiplication. But that is a 
a fact. I'm not going to prove that. We will just assume it. Here are some basic facts about the algebraic integers. First of all, it's easy to see that Rm is an integral domain with 1, because it's a subfield of the complex numbers. Since m is square free, then it cannot be equivalent to 0 mod 4. But for the other three cases, well, if m is equivalent to 2 or 3 mod 4, then rm is actually the ring z adjoined root m, which is a set of all complex numbers of the form a plus b root m, where a and b are integers. However, if m is equivalent to 1 mod 4, then rm is the set z adjoined 1 plus root m over 2. In other words, all numbers of the form a plus b times 1 plus root m over 2, where a and b are integers. So it's a little bit more complicated in this case. r negative 1 is the Gaussian integers, which we have seen previously. And it's easy to show that that is a PID. What's much harder to show is that R negative 19 is a PID. And I mentioned this particular ring because it turns out that this is not a Euclidean domain. And so this is actually the simplest example of a ring that is a PID but is not a Euclidean domain. We are interested in learning which rings of algebraic integers are PIDs and which are Euclidean. And that is, to this day, an open problem. And it will probably remain open for many years to come. But we actually know a lot. So let's start out by defining a norm. So for Q adjoin root M, let's take an element X, which is R plus S root M, and define the norm of X as follows. It is r plus s root m times r minus s root m, which is just r squared minus m s squared. You may notice that if m is negative 1, this is exactly how we defined the norm of the Gaussian integers earlier. So this is, in some sense, a generalization of the norm of the Gaussian integers, or you can think of m as some sort of weight. The ring Rm is said to be norm Euclidean if it is a Euclidean domain where the degree function is the absolute value of this norm. One very useful property about the norm is that it is multiplicative, meaning that the norm of x times y equals the norm of x times the norm of y. There are actually a number of things that we can prove rather easily using this norm. So I think I might do one of these and put another on the homework. So let's assume that m is square free, not equal to 0 or 1. Then u is a unit if and only if the norm is plus or minus 1. So the absolute value of the norm is 1. Well, why is that? Well, u times u inverse. So the norm of that is the norm of u times the norm of u inverse. And the norm of 1 is just 1, so each of these things has to be plus or minus 1. Next, if m is greater than 2, then there are infinitely many units in Rm. I mean, think about it. If m is positive, then both of these terms can be large, one positive and one negative. So in theory, there could be infinitely many combinations of R and S whose difference is 1. And that's, in fact, what this thing says. Now, if, R is, if M is negative, then we have a positive number and a positive number. And there's only going to be very few, if any, combinations of this that will give 1. So that greatly reduces the number of elements that can be units. The units in the Gaussian integers are not surprising, plus and minus 1 and plus and minus i, 
Those are the Gaussian integers that lie in the unit circle. And the units of R negative 3 are plus or minus 1. And 1 plus or minus root negative 3 over 2. And the negative of that as well. So there are, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 6 units in R negative 3. Finally, if m is any other negative number on these things, either m is negative 2 or m is less than negative 3, then there are only two units in our m, namely plus and minus 1. A major result in algebraic number theory is the complete classification of which rings of algebraic integers are norm Euclidean. And that was not even completed until the 1950s, after about 20 years of work by over two dozen mathematicians. So this says that Rm is norm Euclidean if and only if m is one of the following 21 numbers from this list. Now once this was done, people wondered, are there rings of algebraic integers that are Euclidean secretly because they're not norm Euclidean, like there's some weird function that could be a norm that's not the standard norm. And that was unsolved for about 40 years until the 1990s when David Clark proved the following. The ring R69 is indeed a Euclidean domain that is not norm Euclidean. And this came as a surprise to many people. And just for fun, let me show you the norm that he used. Let's let alpha be 1 plus root 69 over 2 and see any integer greater than 25. Then the following degree function works for R69 defined on the prime elements. And from here you can deduce what its value is on all of the non-prime elements. So D of P is just the standard norm or the absolute value of the standard norm if P is not equal to 10 plus 3 alpha, where remember this is alpha, and then it's equal to C if P is equal to 10 plus 3 alpha. This paper is actually quite short. It's just four pages, and it's described as a surprisingly simple result that eluded mathematicians for decades. So it's easy to find this paper online. I encourage you to look it up and check it out for yourself. It is also completely known precisely which rings of algebraic integers are Euclidean for negative m. And that says that these five up here, which are norm Euclidean, are also the only ones which are Euclidean. It is still, to this day, an open problem to classify which rings of algebraic integers are PIDs and which ones are Euclidean. As with Euclidean domains, the classification of which rings of algebraic integers are PIDs for negative n is also known. And this says that Rm is a PID for negative m if and only if m is one of these five numbers, which gives a Euclidean domain, or negative 19, negative 43, negative 67, or negative 163. Using this with the classification of the norm Euclidean rings, we get the following corollary. If m is negative, then Rm is a PID that is not Euclidean if and only if m is either negative 19, negative 43, negative 67, or negative 163. The last three slides of this lecture are all pretty pictures, so sit back, relax, and enjoy. This first one was made by Stephen Brooks, and he, he took a little bit of artistic liberty in doing this. So here is the comp part of the complex plane. Here's the origin. Here is 1, and here is i. And all of these dots represent algebraic numbers. And the colors indicate the coefficient of the leading term. So the red dots correspond to algebraic integers. The leading term is 1. The green dots are when the leading term is 2. And 
blue and yellow correspond to leading terms of 3 and 4. And I suspect I see other colors in here, like I see an orange and a turquoise and a pink or whatever that is. And I suspect that those correspond to, to other leading coefficients. So I said he made artistic liberty not just with the color, but also with the size. The size indicates how simple the polynomial is. So zero has the simplest polynomial, it's just the zero polynomial. And then one is the root of a polynomial x minus one. I is the root of a polynomial x squared plus one. So in general, large dots mean fewer terms and smaller coefficients. So these tiny dots in here correspond to polynomials that either have a lot of terms or have larger coefficients. So this up here, this is a third root of unity. So we know that is a root of x squared plus x plus 1. This picture is also from Wikipedia, but this is just of the algebraic integers and nothing else. So here, each red dot is the root of a monic polynomial of degree less than or equal to 7, and the coefficients are chosen to be one of these 11 numbers. So obviously there's a lot more than this, but just sampling from this many polynomials, let's see how many there are. There are, there are essentially seven coefficients that we can choose at will, because one of them has to be monic, plus the constant term. And with 11 possibilities, then there are roughly 7 to the 11 number of polynomials to choose from, which is approximately, it's just under 2 billion. So I'm not actually sure. I couldn't figure out if the creator of this actually sampled all of those polynomials and then plotted those dots. It seems like a lot of data, or if it's just a subset of these. Of course, a lot of those roots might be the same. Um, but I'm not sure about that. But here's what they look like. And I think it's fascinating of how many patterns arise. Like, you see this, first of all, you see a gap here and around one and around here as well. I really don't know what happens if you were to plot higher degree polynomials. Like if you let the degree be not just 7, but 10 or 20 or 2 million, would these gaps start to fill in or not? Um, that said, there's plenty of amazing patterns. You can see um, he, around here you, you have these lines and you have these little spikes that come in. And patterns like this arise all throughout mathematics. It's one of the reasons why people say math is so beautiful. And some people say that math really is the study of patterns. So that's, I want to leave you with this. And then I have one more slide about the classification of rings. In fact, a refinement of what we did on the last lecture. Recall from the last lecture that I said that fields were the rings that had the most structure. Now in this lecture, we learned about Euclidean domains. Every field is a Euclidean domain, but not vice versa. So here are some examples of the Euclidean domains that are not fields. The Gaussian integers, the ordinary integers, polynomial rings over fields, and R69. And there's other ones as well, but this is all I could fit. Every Euclidean domain is a PID, but not every PID is a Euclidean domain. Here are the four PIDs that we saw that were not Euclidean. Every PID is a UFD. We saw these in the previous lecture. Here are two UFDs that are not PIDs. Every UFD is an integral domain, but not vice versa. Here are two integral domains that are not UFDs. Every integral domain is commutative. Now these three rings, well these two rings all have zero, both have zero divisors, and this ring does not have an identity, so they are not integral. Finally, we have things like group rings, or non-abelian groups, matrix rings, and the Hamiltonians, which are all non-commutative. Now let me say one quick comment that I did not put in here the norm Euclidean domains, and that's because that is specific to being to the rings of algebraic integers. So if I were to put that in, it would look something like this. It would include r negative 1, but not r 69. However, it's, it's not clear, is z a norm Euclidean domain? What about f bracket x? See, that's, that's not just a definition for general rings. That's a definition for a particular type of ring. And it doesn't really make sense to talk about um, other Euclidean domains 
that are not algebraic numbers. So I left that out, and this right here is a great summary of the different types of rings we studied and how they are related to each other.